Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever written a piece of code, right? It's working fine and you know, you start to add features to it, it gets bigger. And then you go, hey, I've got this really brilliant idea to add this new thing. You try to do it and you realize, oh, wait a minute, that doesn't really go in anywhere. I can't really do that without changing up everything. So what do you do now? Do you throw everything out and rewrite? Or do you attempt to sort of reorganize things to salvage the situation? Guess what? There is a name for the latter, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. That process is called refactoring. All this and more on this random Wednesday episode. Hello and welcome back to another random Wednesday episode. Yes, that panic scrambling to try and reorganize your code actually has a name, and it's actually a formal process. Well, maybe minus the panicking part, though I'm not entirely sure about that. In fact, refactoring is a standard thing that you kind of have to do unless you, you know, were really perfect in terms of your planning, which rarely, if ever, happens. And it does have a particular definition as to what it is. First and foremost, refactoring is not rewriting. If you throw out your code and write it from scratch, that is not refactoring, that is rewriting. And it's something that you want to avoid. After all, that old code actually worked. You've used it, you've tested it in the real world, so you have some guarantees about what it actually does. It's just that it's not really organized nice enough for you to add additional functionality. So it's an organizational issue. You don't want to throw it out, right, and write brand new code that could introduce brand new bugs, or just have things work differently than you expect. Instead, when you refactor, your goal is to actually have things work exactly the same way. Yes, that's right, a successful refactoring run means that your program works the exact same way as before. You don't see any tangible change at all. In fact, here's one analogy for refactoring. It's basically like cleaning your room or cleaning your house. It doesn't directly achieve anything. You just, you know, at the end of it go like, ah, that looks nicer, but it doesn't directly give you anything good. Instead, it enables you to do your next thing with less difficulty. So that is refactoring in a nutshell, right? That is the what. Now, in terms of the when, that's a pretty interesting question as well. Really, you could do refactoring anywhere along the sort of development process, but more often than not, it is done as a maintenance step. You see, here's the deal. When you write a program, you usually will start by analyzing requirements, then you move on to write your code, testing and debugging before releasing it out into the world. Chances are, after you've done that, you need to maintain your code. Perhaps your client might go, hey, for phase number two, here are some additional features I want. So you go back to the drawing board, and perhaps you realize that it's a little bit difficult to fit those new features, you know, into the story. That is when refactoring shines. That is when you actually reorganize things, so it's easier to do that. In fact, before we go into how we actually do refactoring, let me tell you a short story about refactoring and how it really hit me in the face not too long ago. If you're not interested, well, there is a link somewhere, you could skip ahead. Here's a view. You remember how some time ago I did that exercise bike project? You know, the one in which I paddled and it will move Google Street View forwards. I would have some GUI that tracked essentially, well, how fast I was going and how much I was burning. Well, guess what? That worked just fine. In fact, it worked really well and I've cycled a lot just sitting here. But I wanted to change things up. Instead of seeing numbers, I wanted to see a nice graph. And that was when I really hit a brick wall. Of course, that was entirely my fault because the way I organized my code was that the logic and the things controlling the GUI, basically everything you see on screen, were just mashed together. Essentially, it was all tangled up. And what I needed to do was to essentially pull out the existing GUI and replace it with a separate one. And I couldn't do it because these two things were all mashed together. In fact, that inspired this video because I spent a good five to six hours just sitting there and refactoring my code to untangle all the spaghetti. And yeah, at the end of the day, I was able to actually implement my graph GUI. But well, not before all that painful refactoring. So yeah, with that background out of the way, Let's go ahead and take a look at how. How do we actually do refactoring? What are some of the techniques? 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through just a couple of the most common techniques. There are actually tons of refractoring techniques out there, but chances are these are the ones you're going to use the most often. So yeah, let's do it list style. Let's go through it from the top. Let's start with two simple ones that just involve making your code more readable, and that will be renaming techniques. Now, firstly, if you have a variable in which you, know, you stared at it and you didn't really know what it was doing, it's not named well. Same deal for functions. And in fact, when you're working on a large software engineering project, chances are there are some conventions to follow when you use variable names or function names. If you haven't done that, refactoring is a good time to make that change. Second, and this is considered one of the big sins in programming, magic numbers. Now, let's say you took a look at a line of code and there's just a number hanging there. It's not always clear what that number actually is or where it came from. You see, when you're writing the code, it's fine, right? In your head, you know what that number means, but looking back at it, it might not be so clear. This is what we call a magic number, a number that has appeared for no reason, you know, magically, and it's actually what we do during refactoring. Well, if you could figure out what that number means, is to break it out. Create a constant or a variable that holds that value. While this feels redundant, again, its role is to help in readability. If you were to look at the fixed version of the code, you can see how much better it is at conveying intent. This is what I want the variable to mean. Instead of having to figure out what a solitary number actually meant, you are now using a named variable, and that tells you what the intention is. So there you go, these are two simple renaming techniques to make things a little bit more readable. But at this point, we haven't really gone into the organizational aspect of things, so let's go there. One of the best ways to help with the organization is to actually move things around. And to put it generally, there are two techniques to do this. Firstly, it's extracting, and secondly, it's inlining. And I find myself doing extracting a lot more often. You see, the idea is this. When you have a very long function, what you can do is, well, you'll realize that, hey, there's something here that I can take it out. So what you do is you extract that as a separate function. This is called extract function refactoring. Its counterpart would be to inline a function. That is, you have a function that is being called, and what you want to do is you want to take the function and just, you know, substitute it into the code. Now, I don't find myself doing this anywhere near as often because I tend to have a lot of code and I want to break things out. But inlining a method could be useful if, well, having it separately is entirely redundant. And, well, it doesn't really affect readability if you inline it. Other than doing this with functions, you can also do this with classes. Now, chances are when you're working with a large enough project, you have some kind of object orientation going on. And essentially what you can do is, if you find yourself using you know, certain data structures too often, you could extract it out as a separate class. Now, here's one example I really like uh, to show this. Right? Remember how some time ago we did this project, you know, building a particle system in like 30 minutes? We used OOP. Every single particle was an object. So what that means is each particle has its own position, has its own speed. You call a function, it knows what to do, right? It knows where to move to. When I first built a particle system, I didn't do that. Instead, I had a bunch of parallel arrays. Each array would hold each particle's, uh, well, position and speed. And I had to loop through all the arrays and essentially do the calculations on values at the same index. Of course, you could do that, right? That's not wrong, but that makes things a lot less organized. It's a lot harder to actually read. Essentially, you could do an extract class. You could turn your parallel arrays into just a single array, but each array item actually holds an object representing your particle. So yeah, that is a simple example of extracting things out into a class. This again helps a lot with readability because you don't have to you know, think about things in terms of the low level math. Instead, you can just deal with an abstraction. If you looked at a single particle and you said move forward, the intention is abundantly clear. You want to move it forward. And well, some calculation will happen based on its current position and speed. The counterpart to extracting class is of course inlining a class. Now, I don't think that's something you would really do, but the idea is if you have a class that's completely redundant, 
you could of course sort of subsume it into your code, right? Turn it back into just dealing with data instead of having to instantiate a separate class. Now, staying on the theme of OOP, here's another. If you have some classes that inherit from each other, sometimes you may want to move functions up or down the inheritance tree. Here's a deal. The higher up something is in the inheritance tree means, well, more child classes actually need to implement that function. So where you put a particular function, you know, is pretty strategic. Let's say now among your child classes, you have implemented some functions that seem to work more or less similarly. Well, you could move that function up to the parent class. This essentially gives you a guarantee that the child classes need to function similarly in a particular way. The opposite is also possible if you have something, you know, in a parent class that you realize is far too broad, well, you could push it down to the child classes so that it's no longer necessary for every single child class to implement that function. Again, the reason is organizational in nature, and it's all about expressing your intent. If you're going to tag something to a parent class, you are expressing the intent that, well, all child classes need to do the same thing. Whether you actually want to do that depends on what you're trying to express. And as your thought processes change, as requirements change, well, moving things up and down the inheritance tree may be something you need to do as well. So that has been some broad refactoring techniques you could use to push things around, to help you with your organization. Now, here are two more sort of miscellaneous ones that I'll cover with you before I let you go. Again, previously, we were talking about how different classes or different modules actually interacted with each other. Now, if we were to talk generally about just modules in general, you could implement dependencies between modules in a couple of ways. For example, let's say here are two modules that work with each other. A naive, simple implementation would involve these two modules knowing about, you know, the inlets of each other. So we draw this as an arrow of two sides, right? Essentially, these two modules are dependent on each other. In software engineering terms, this is high coupling and this is not good because essentially what happens is if you were to tweak up one module, you might break the other. Reason being the other module is built with knowledge of, well, the first module, right? So that's not great. One thing you could do with refactoring is you could eliminate this bi-directional relationship. Tweak up your code so that they communicate with a fixed language, and so your second module no longer needs to depend on your first. And what that allows you to do is to tweak up your first module in whatever way you want. As long as they communicate using the same language, everything will be fine. So this is one kind of refactoring you'll definitely want to do to make things easier for yourself down the line. This to a certain extent is what happened with me, right? My GUI stuff, and my actual logic were all meshed together. By eliminating this need for these two things to work so closely together, I have essentially decoupled these two modules. And here's the added advantage. I have what is known as substitutability. Because now it's essentially just a fixed language between these two modules, I could replace my GUI module with another module. Because of the fact that, well, they speak the same language, this new GUI module would work just fine. And the best part is the logic doesn't know and doesn't care. It just puts out information. You use it in whatever way you need. Moving on, our last refactoring technique involves error handling. Now here's the deal. It's not really intuitive to give exceptions a lot of thought. Usually, if we were handling something that could have error conditions, we simply use if statements to check. If everything is well, then run the action. Otherwise, don't, right? So if you had to write all this in a function, you could choose to return an error message. Alternatively, you could print an error message on screen. Of course, as part of your actual code to drive this, you will have to check to see if the return value is an error or not. Now, this is not great for a multitude of reasons. Now, if you were to use print statements, your code out here, of course, cannot actually detect that an error has occurred, so that's not great. And if you were to return error codes like this, it becomes very unclear what this function actually returns. It could give you an error code, it could give you the actual answer. It's not really clear, and so that impacts readability. 
Of course, there are other issues as well, including how to actually assign these error codes, right? You have to decide what number means what error. It's a whole can of worms. So one thing you could do during refactoring to make things better is to make use of exceptions. Instead of returning something, you would throw an exception when an invalid or error case has been encountered. Apart from being able to avoid the issues that we've mentioned just now, notice also that your main body code looks so much prettier. Under the try block, you would immediately see the code in the success case. And then the errors come in and you handle the errors one by one. So this makes your code overall more readable. It is far clearer as to what your function actually returns as well. As your project gets bigger, exceptions are something you may want to use so you can express your intentions clearer. And there you go, that is refactoring in a nutshell. And what we've just seen are some of the most common techniques to do that. Now, there are many other ways to do refactoring, right? And in fact, maybe some ways that are intuitive that you don't really have a name for. Well, at the end of the day, all that matters is that you are trying to make things easier to work with. You're tweaking your organization, you're making things more readable. And all this with the goal of making your code more maintainable, more readable. Like I said, refactoring is something you probably have to do at one point of time or another, you know, as long as your projects get quite big. And it's definitely a much better alternative to rewriting everything. Remember, rewriting code means throwing out tried and tested stuff. Chances are you'll want to avoid doing that. In my case, after refactoring my exercise bike project, I was able to add more functionality to it. So yeah, all's well that ends well. I don't have to rewrite a lot of the math that went into actually making everything click. Anyway, that's all there is for this Random Wednesday episode. I hope you've gained some insight today, right? I think refactoring is definitely a useful skill to have. But yeah, that's it. Until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.